This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. Happy New Year! We're halfway through Season 6 and kicking off the new year with a new series. The public has always been fascinated by the lifestyles of the wealthy. There have even been whole television shows dedicated to taking an inside look at those who are privileged to have the best of everything. The most expensive cars, designer clothes, and the biggest, most opulent homes. I too take a keen interest in how the other half lives. However, as you can imagine, when the lifestyles of the rich and famous meet true crime, that's when my interest is really piqued. In this month's series, Mansion Murders, I'll be detailing crimes that occurred in some of California's most beautiful and expensive residences. First up, an heiress in the early 1900s endeavors to build the largest home ever constructed in California. But the project is beset by problems from its inception. Decades later, it will become the setting of a double kidnapping and murder. This is the story of Chateau Carolands in Hillsboro, California. Harriet Pullman was born in 1869 into the prosperous Pullman family. Her father, George Pullman, was a 19th century industrialist who built his fortune as the designer and builder of the Pullman railroad car. The sleeper car introduced luxury train travel and top-notch service to the American public for the very first time. The first Pullman car made its appearance in 1864 and quickly proved popular with travelers. Harriet Pullman grew up with the best of everything. She acquired a love of luxury and spared no expense on her clothes, furnishings, and surroundings. She especially loved all things French. Harriet made many trips to France and, back home, incorporated French food, art, style, and architecture into her day-to-day -day life. She attended schools in both New York and Europe and became fluent in French and German. In 1892, she married Francis Carolyn, the son of a prominent and wealthy Sacramento family. Carolyn spent most of his time playing polo and indulging in the sport of fox hunting, which he introduced to his high society friends in the San Francisco Bay Area. The couple settled in the town of Burlingame, located just south of San Francisco. In 1897, George Pullman died, and Harriet and her sister Florence were left the bulk of his estate. Their mother Hattie inherited property and a generous yearly income. But Pullman's two youngest children, twin boys named George and Walter, were deemed by their father to be too irresponsible to inherit his fortune. So instead, he awarded them $3,000 annually, or about $100,000 in today's money. With her portion of the Pullman inheritance, Harriet instantly became one of the wealthiest women in the United States. With her fortune secured, she now made it her goal to bring European refinement to the West Coast. She set out to build the biggest, most opulent home ever constructed west of the Mississippi. Harriet was a social climber, and at that time, fancied herself in competition with another socialite, Ethel Crocker. Ethel was the wife of William H. Crocker, founder of Crocker Bank. Harriet aspired to have the most beautiful home in which to entertain San Francisco's social set, as well as to hold charity balls and other functions. She envisioned these parties would be hot-ticket events that would be written about in all the society columns, with her name prominently featured, of course. Harriet Pullman Carolyn had spent her life cultivating class and style, and her home would be her showcase. But the great San Francisco earthquake of 1906 wiped out many homes in the city and made others uninhabitable. Some wealthy San Franciscans left the city and established a brand new community 15 miles to the south. Incorporated in 1910, the town of Hillsboro was founded to be a place the top 1% could come to build their estates. Hillsboro was located among rolling hills overlooking the San Francisco Bay Area. It came to be called the Municipality of Millionaires. To keep the community exclusive, only estates could be built within its borders and non-white people could not purchase land on which to build. The town was not desegregated until 1963. In addition, no non-residential properties were permitted to be constructed and no business was allowed to be conducted in the town proper. Hillsboro remained strictly a residential rural suburb where even sidewalks were not allowed. 
Even today, the minimum lot size permitted is one half acre, and Hillsborough remains one of the wealthiest communities in the nation. It was in this town that Harriet decided to build her mansion. In 1912, she purchased 550 acres and enlisted famed French architect Ernest Sanson to design it in the style of Louis XIV's Palace of Versailles. The home she named Chateau Carolens would encompass 46,000 square feet over four and a half levels. Its enormous lobby was flanked on either side by a grand staircase. A rooftop skylight stood 103 feet above the dramatic foyer. Chateau Carolens would boast 98 rooms with four kitchens, 18 bathrooms, and an elevator. Of course, there would be grand dining halls and ballrooms in which to entertain in style. Craftsmen and builders were enlisted from Europe to see to every detail. Some rooms were exact replicas of rooms from beautiful homes that Harriet had visited in Paris and other European cities. But the project was plagued by problems from the start. There was fierce competition for building materials after the devastation left behind after the 1906 earthquake and the rebuilding of San Francisco. Additionally, the Pan Pacific International Expo, the World's Fair, was scheduled to be held in San Francisco in 1915. One square mile in size, the expo required hundreds of builders, engineers, and workers to construct the halls and buildings that would house its exhibits. Although most were designed to be dismantled at the end of the nine-and-a-half-month expo, some buildings that still remain include San Francisco's Palace of Fine Arts, what is now called the Bill Graham Civic Auditorium, and the Japanese Tea House. All of this construction, of course, along with the great quantities of building materials needed, would compete with Harriet's project. The construction of the chateau continued to face delays and rising construction costs as well. The amount of money being spent and Harriet's near-total obsession with the project put a strain on her marriage. She was determined to have the house completed so they could hold their first grand party, her and Frank's 25th anniversary soiree. Well, the house wasn't finished, but Harriet decided to hold the event anyway. Held in 1917, the anniversary party was a much more scaled-down affair than originally planned with only 16 guests in attendance. It would be the only event that Harriet ever hosted at Chateau Carolands. By the end of that year, she and Frank had separated, and he moved into an apartment in San Francisco's Fairmont Hotel. He would live there until his death in 1923, succumbing to heart disease at the age of 60. He and Harriet were still legally married at the time of his death. Two years later, in 1925, Harriet remarried and moved to the East Coast. She closed up the mansion, and it remained empty for the next 29 years. Harriet Pullman Carolyn's grand project, the Carolyn's Mansion, became a white elephant. Although it was a beautiful residence, and she had spared no expense to build it, Harriet rarely even visited the chateau after she remarried and moved to New York. Ultimately, in 1928, the home was emptied of her furnishings and it was placed up for sale. The United States government even considered purchasing the mansion to use as a Western White House, first in the 1930s and again when John F. Kennedy was in office. But it was not to be. In 1945, the house finally found its first buyer. Tomlinson Mosley, an inventor and entrepreneur, purchased the house and land for $400,000. Mosley was the inventor of the electric toothbrush, electric razor, and the phonograph needle. This last invention was purchased by RCA Victor and made Mosley a very wealthy man. Mosley and his family only lived at Carolyn's for two years, but while they were there, the mansion finally fulfilled its intended purpose. Several charity events were held at the mansion, including a fundraiser attended by 1,500 people. Life magazine even sent reporters and photographers to cover this event for the magazine. For many San Franciscans, it was the first chance they ever had to see the inside of the home. Life magazine's readers were curious about the French chateau that they learned had cost over $2 million to build three decades earlier. Mosley began parceling off the land in two acre lots for sale during his time as owner. Several other large homes were built on this land in the years following the end of World War II. In 1948, when he ultimately sold the home, only 25 acres of the original 550 remained. The Carol Lands was sold at this time for $250,000. The third owner also held onto the property only briefly, 
most likely because the upkeep and repair of such a large house was costly. But the fourth owner had the resources available to bring Caroline's back to its former glory, and she would remain living in the mansion for the rest of her life. Countess Lillian Remillard Dandini saved the chateau from planned demolition. The enormous home had fallen into disrepair and become an eyesore for the tiny Hillsboro community. But the Countess saw the beauty and potential of the chateau and purchased the property in 1950 for a scant $80,000. The 70-year-old Countess was heiress to the Remillard brothers' fortune, who had made their money in brick manufacturing. The company, which dated back to the California Gold Rush, profited first from the construction boom when the city of San Francisco was founded, and then again after the 1906 earthquake. As a result, Lillian Remillard became a very wealthy woman. At the age of 52, Remillard met and married 32-year-old Count Alessandro Dandini. Dandini, born in Mexico, claimed his title as a descendant of one of Italy's oldest and most prominent noble families. Now Countess Dandini, Lillian inherited the brick company after the death of her mother. The Countess soon named her husband, whom she called Sandro, as vice president of the company, renaming it the Remillard Dandini Brick Company. But the Count was said to be something of a playboy. Handsome, dashing, and popular with the ladies, Lillian must have gotten wind of some philandering, because she and Dandini split up in 1938, just shy of their seventh wedding anniversary. Soon after, she charged her estranged husband with embezzling company funds, which she claimed he used to entertain other women. He denied it, and countered that he had been, quote, inadequately compensated for his largely symbolic role in the company. The couple didn't divorce, but remained apart. Then in 1942, Dandini was arrested and charged with tax evasion. He pled guilty and served 18 months in prison. Upon his release, he asked Lillian for a divorce, but she refused, not wanting to relinquish her title of countess. It appeared Dandini decided to act as if he was divorced anyway, because he moved to Nevada, got a quickie divorce, and remarried. However, the state of California did not recognize his divorce as legal, so in the eyes of the law, the count had committed bigamy. Perhaps to avoid ending up behind bars for a second time, Dandini remained in Nevada, living in Reno and teaching classes in engineering and foreign language at the University of Nevada, Reno. He would be instrumental in securing a site from the U.S. government on which Truckee Meadows Community College was founded in Truckee, California. He died in 1991 at the age of 92. Countess Lillian Remillard Dandini remained a countess and now put all her time and energy into restoring Chateau Carolands, which she now rechristened Chateau Remillard. However, that name did not really resonate with the locals, who continued to refer to the mansion as the Carolands. After putting the house back in order, the countess held many charity and benefit events at the mansion. Some of the recipients of her generosity included local community colleges, the San Francisco Symphony, the Daughters of the American Revolution, and music and art programs. The Countess herself was a trained opera singer, but had to forego a musical career to help run the family's brick company. Countess Dandini lived and entertained in the home she loved for 23 years before dying in 1973 at the age of 93. Even with her fortune, the Countess had been unable to keep up with the costly maintenance the 100-room mansion required, and it had begun to lose its luster. Upon her death, she willed the property to the town of Hillsboro to be used as a literary and art center, but she did not leave an endowment to fund this project. The town declined to take ownership, citing the cost to maintain the mansion. Over the next several years, Chateau Carolands changed ownership four more times. Between 1976 and 1982, it was awarded to one potential owner at a probate auction, but the winner declined to complete the deal. Then it was lost in foreclosure by another owner, and in 1982, the mansion was even loaned out to a film company to produce a porn film titled All American Girls. The house once again fell to seed and became merely a curiosity to locals, especially teens who often tried to sneak onto the property in search of a party house. The town, afraid of vandalism and or lawsuits should someone become injured on the property, hired a series of security guards over the years to keep the curious off the grounds. In 1985, local high school students heard rumors that some of these security guards could be persuaded to give tours of the mansion. On Saturday, February 2nd, 1985, 16-year-old Janine Grinsell and 17-year-old Lori McKenna, friends and classmates at nearby Burlingame High School, decided to drive up to the abandoned chateau and request a tour. 
When they arrived, they met the 23-year-old security guard, David Allen Rayleigh, who agreed to show them inside the mansion. But just a short time later, the Carolans mansion would become nothing less than a house of horrors for the girls. Saturday morning and the weather was perfect for a drive into the hills of the San Francisco Bay Area. Janine Grinsell had recently obtained her driver's license and like any new teen driver, she was eager to get behind the wheel. She invited her friend Lori McKenna to come along. Lori thought it sounded like fun. The girls had learned from other students at Burlingame High that unofficial tours of the abandoned mansion could sometimes be arranged. The girls headed up the hill and pulled up to the entrance of the mansion. The security guard, David Allen Rayleigh, emerged and greeted them. He was stout, bearded, and somehow appeared both older and younger than his 23 years. Perhaps it was the receding hairline or the chubby cheeks. The girls had heard from others that the security guards sometimes creeped on teenage girls who were curious to see the mansion. He made crude jokes about guards trading sex for tours and other suggestive comments. But the girls weren't intimidated by him. He seemed harmless, and they walked with him through the 100-room mansion for several minutes without incident. However, there was at least one red flag which they ignored. Rayleigh had asked the girls to move their car to another part of the property so that it was hidden. He told them that he didn't want to get into trouble for allowing unauthorized visitors onto the property. To Lori and Janine, this seemed to make sense. After the tour, they started back towards the entrance of the mansion. But Rayleigh suddenly halted and said that police dogs had arrived and the girls needed to hide so he wouldn't lose his job. Lori and Janine asked him where they should go. Rayleigh led them to a room in the basement and showed them a vault, motioning for them to get inside. Alarmed, the girls said that they didn't want to be locked in, but Rayleigh promised he wouldn't shut the door. But once they had stepped inside, he closed the door after them. They called out to the guard to let them out, but heard nothing for a few minutes. Panicking now, the girls began to scream and cry, pleading with Rayleigh to release them. Then they heard the guard calling out in a teasing sing-song voice. Lori, he said. Through the door, Rayleigh told the girls he would let them out only if they took off all their clothes. When they couldn't figure out another way to get out of this terrible predicament, they finally agreed and began to undress. Rayleigh directed them to throw their clothes out of the vault as he opened the door. The girls had kept their underwear on, and as they emerged, he handcuffed them behind their backs. Rayleigh now brandished a large knife. Unclothed, Lori and Janine were freezing in the cold, drafty mansion on this frigid February day. Their captor then told them that he would let them go once they, quote, fooled around with him for five minutes. He took both girls to a workroom where they saw that a length of rope had already been tied to a bench. He tied this rope securely to Lori's handcuffs and then led Janine out of the room. A few minutes later, Lori heard her friend scream. Rayleigh returned with Janine approximately 15 minutes later. She was now dressed, and Lori described her friend's face as, quote, purple from the cold. Rayleigh then tied Janine to the workbench and covered the shivering girl with his coat before taking Lori away. He led her to a kitchen and directed her to remove the rest of her clothes. Lori saw the knife sitting on a table next to Rayleigh and also the billy club hanging from his belt. Rayleigh demanded that she kiss him and orally copulate him, but the terrified girl couldn't bring herself to do it. Rayleigh was becoming angry and impatient, so she manually manipulated him until he ejaculated. He continued to try and force her to perform sex acts on him, but she could not and refused to let him penetrate her. Finally, he told her to get dressed. He told her that he was going to let them go, but would kill them if they ever told anyone what had happened. He took Lori back to the kitchen and retrieved Janine, again saying he was going to let them go. But instead, Rayleigh handcuffed Lori to another door and left with Janine again. Lori heard her friend scream loudly several times. Rayleigh then returned once more with Janine and tied her up next to Lori. What the girls didn't know was that a police officer had arrived at the mansion. He wasn't there on a call, but was an acquaintance of Rayleigh's. Rayleigh was something of a cop groupie or a frustrated wannabe police officer who liked to associate with real cops. 
the officer had come about a CB radio that Rayleigh was interested in purchasing from him. If you don't know what a CB radio is, ask your dad. When the officer arrived, he found the gates to the mansion wired shut, which he knew was unusual. The front door of the mansion was also locked. The officer leaned inside Rayleigh's car, which was parked near the front door, and honked the horn. A few minutes later, the security guard emerged from the house looking nervous. Rayleigh agreed to give the officer a deposit for the radio, but then quickly ended the conversation. Also unusual, the officer noted. Rayleigh usually wanted to gab nonstop about police business or just pass the time during the hours he was assigned to guard the mansion. While Rayleigh was gone, Janine told her friend that he had hit her with the billy club. Both girls were sobbing and desperate to leave the mansion. Rayleigh returned, grabbed Janine by the arm, and dragged her away once again. Lori could hear bumping noises and Janine screaming in another part of the house. She next heard the sound of something being dragged. Terrified, shivering, and in a state of shock, Lori trembled with fright as Rayleigh returned without her friend. He began pulling her towards a dark hallway, and she resisted. Rayleigh raised the knife he was carrying at his side and stabbed the girl in the stomach. She fell, taking Rayleigh to the floor with her. There was a struggle, and Rayleigh continued to plunge the knife into the girl as she screamed. In total, Lori was stabbed 35 times, but she continued to fight. Rayleigh also hit her over the head with the club. Losing strength now, Lori lay helpless and bleeding on the floor. Her attacker left the room and returned with a rug. He rolled her up in it and dragged her out of the house. Opening the trunk of his 1973 Plymouth, Rayleigh dumped the teen inside. Lori saw Janine, bloody and with her hands tied behind her back, lying in the trunk. Rayleigh walked away and they heard nothing else. The car didn't move and the girls lay in the trunk, freezing, stabbed, bludgeoned, and in shock for over two hours. Twenty-three-year-old David Rayleigh, working as a security guard at the Carolands, had lured 16-year-old Janine Grinsell and 17-year-old Lori McKenna into the 100-room mansion, locked them up, sexually assaulted them, stabbed and beat them, and finally left them battered and bleeding in the trunk of his car for hours. Rayleigh's shift at the mansion ended at 4 p.m., but the next guard didn't show up to relieve him. At 5.15, Rayleigh's supervisor arrived, and Rayleigh told him he had to go, that he could no longer wait for the other employee, explaining he had an appointment to meet his father at 6 p.m. Rayleigh left the mansion with the girls still locked in his trunk. He lived with his father and sister in South San Jose, almost an hour's drive down Highway 101. Once he arrived, he parked his car in the family's garage and let the injured teens out of the trunk. They tried to stretch their limbs and get their blood circulating again and told Rayleigh they were freezing. He handed them blankets or sleeping bags to cover themselves with. Rayleigh began trying to clean the blood out of the trunk of his car. While he cleaned, the girls tried talking to him in an attempt to talk him into letting them go, but he remained silent. Lori pleaded with her captor to take her to the hospital. She promised that she wouldn't identify who had hurt her. Lori would describe Rayleigh's response to this as, quote, a death stare or a look of hatred. He didn't answer her. A few minutes later, Rayleigh left the garage and returned with a rifle. He pointed it at Lori and told her if she kept talking, his friend Bob would kill her. The girls heard voices and Rayleigh shoved them back inside the trunk. He told them that Bob had arrived and if they remained quiet, he would try to convince this man not to kill them. Of course, there was no Bob. The voice they heard was Rayleigh's sister who just returned home. Again, Rayleigh left the girls locked in the trunk, joining his sister in the house. While Rayleigh declined to have dinner, saying he wasn't feeling well, he and his sister spent the hours from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. watching television and playing a game of Monopoly. She would later say that she had detected nothing out of the ordinary in her brother's behavior. Rayleigh's father arrived home around midnight, and soon after that, some friends stopped by to show Rayleigh their new car stereo. He sat outside with them for a while. Sometime after his father returned home, Rayleigh moved his car out of the garage and parked it on the street with the girls still inside the trunk. Later that night, Lori came to when she felt the car moving again. Rayleigh seemed to be driving around aimlessly, stopping the car several times. Once he even opened the trunk, but then closed it again, got back behind the wheel, and kept driving. In the early morning hours, Rayleigh stopped the Plymouth a few miles from his house. 
He had driven to the edge of a ravine located on Silver Creek Road, just off Highway 101. Side note, I lived just off Silver Creek Road for several years in the mid-1990s and early 2000s. There's now a development of large homes and a country club in this area, but at that time it was pretty isolated, with several acres of rolling hills and steep drop-offs. People would sometimes dump old appliances and other refuse down the ravine where Rayleigh parked his car. He opened the trunk and lifted Janine out, leaving Lori locked inside. A few minutes later, he returned and pulled Lori out too. He began striking her on her head and neck with the billy club. Lori raised her hands and arms in an attempt to ward off the blows as best she could, but began to pass out. She was still tied up, and Rayleigh dragged her to the edge of the ravine and threw her over. She began sliding down the side, but stopped just a few feet down from the edge. Rayleigh then kicked her further down the side, saying, quote, Here, be with your friend. End quote. He then returned to his car and drove away. The night was cold and it started to drizzle. Lori drifted in and out of consciousness, but had no energy to do anything but lie among the garbage and struggle to stay alive. As dawn began to break, she finally trusted that Rayleigh was gone and wasn't just waiting at the top of the ravine to beat or stab her again. She had to try and get to help. Her hands were badly cut from the knife attack, and she couldn't use them to pull herself up. Instead, she commando crawled on her forearms and elbows, making her way inch by inch up the side of the ravine. Finally reaching the top, covered in dirt and blood and soaking wet, Lori desperately tried to flag down passing vehicles. Two cars passed by before a truck finally stopped. She told the man what had happened and that her friend was still in the ravine. The two women were rescued at about 8.30 a.m. and transported to the hospital. Both were able to talk, and they identified the security guard, David Rayleigh, as their attacker. Both Lori and Janine were suffering from blood loss, shock, and hypothermia. Janine Grinzel had been stabbed 41 times, and her skull was fractured. When she arrived at the emergency room, she had no measurable blood pressure. Janine died that morning at 11.35 a.m. at Santa Teresa Hospital. Lori McKenna would survive. David Rayleigh was arrested at his home that same day and charged with one count of murder, one count of attempted murder, two counts of assault with intent to commit rape, and two counts of kidnapping. The district attorney attached special circumstances of extreme cruelty and torture in the commission of the crime, which made Rayleigh eligible to receive the death penalty if convicted. His trial began in March of 1987. The evidence against him was overwhelming, and Lori McKenna's testimony all but ensured a conviction. His defense attorney could only grasp at straws, pointing out that Rayleigh wasn't the only security guard to give unauthorized tours to kids, although it appears he was the only one to add sexual assault and attempted murder to the program. His defense also presented testimony by a doctor who claimed Janine had not received adequate care for hypothermia when she'd arrived at the emergency room. They argued that this was Janine's real cause of death. However, it appears they skipped the detail that Rayleigh had kicked her down a ravine on a frigid winter evening, which was the reason both girls had suffered from hypothermia in the first place. Nice try. After a trial that lasted almost two months, David Rayleigh was convicted of one count of first-degree murder, one count of attempted murder, and kidnapping with special circumstances. The penalty phase of his trial began on May 5, 1987. The jury deadlocked 7-5 to five in favor of the death penalty, and a mistrial was declared. A second penalty trial began on February 29, 1988. At the second trial, the defense presented witnesses who had been given tours of the Carolans' mansion by Rayleigh. The defense elicited testimony from these witnesses that the tours were uneventful and that Rayleigh had not threatened or harmed them in any way. Rayleigh's sister took the stand during the penalty phase and testified that their mother was an alcoholic who was emotionally and physically abusive to David. David's father corroborated this testimony. The defense also pointed out that Rayleigh had had no prior convictions. But the prosecutors presented their own witnesses during the penalty phase who testified that Rayleigh routinely harassed women, even following them home on occasion. Rayleigh's mother took the stand to say that she had never been violent or verbally abusive to her son. A neighbor of the Rayleigh's also backed this up, saying that David had, quote, good parents and that she didn't believe his mother was a heavy drinker. The prosecutor made a case that David Rayleigh had a history as a predator. Two witnesses gave testimony that Rayleigh committed lewd acts on them when they were just children. Another testified that Rayleigh had locked her in a camper, made her undress, 
and took photos of her and another child. These incidents had occurred when Raley was a teenager. Reports were presented to the court of complaints made to David Raley's parents about his inappropriate behavior with children during that time. His parents had assured these neighbors that they were seeking psychiatric help for their son. However, after just three visits, Raley's father had ended them, saying that there was, quote, no need for his son to see a psychiatrist. Raley, it was reported, had spoken to an acquaintance while he was in jail awaiting trial. This person testified that he told her that he didn't remember what happened and that he would plead insanity and be out in a matter of months. He also claimed during this conversation that it was Janine and Lori who had brought up the topic of sex. When they started talking about sex, Raley said, he, quote, went crazy. The jury returned with its decision on May 17th, fixing the penalty as death. Rayleigh was sent to San Quentin State Prison to await his execution date. David Ellen Rayleigh was sentenced to die, but the sentence entitled him to an automatic appeal. His appeal came before the California Supreme Court in 1992, but it was denied. However, one part of his conviction, the attempted oral copulation with Janine Grinsell, was dropped. The court ruled that this portion of the charge was speculative. Rayleigh's death sentence was unanimously upheld in 2006, and his final appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court was rejected in 2007. In 2013, his attorney attempted to claim that Rayleigh was autistic and asked for his sentence to be commuted to life in prison without the possibility of parole. They cited the Supreme Court decision of Atkins v. Virginia in 2002, which ruled that execution of a developmentally disabled criminal was, quote, cruel and unusual punishment. The commutation request was rejected in September of that year. Rayleigh fired his attorneys, angry that they had claimed to the court that he was developmentally disabled. However, in 2006, a federal judge stayed all executions in the state of California after hearing arguments that the lethal injection protocol used by state prisons was problematic and should be considered cruel and unusual punishment. Various arguments for and against lifting the moratorium on executions in California wound their way through the courts over the next decade. In 2017, the state Supreme Court upheld Proposition 66, which allowed for prison administrations to finalize the execution procedures after federal courts reviewed new protocols. Rayleigh will be one of the first inmates to receive an execution date once the legal challenges have concluded. Survivor Lori McKenna remained in the hospital for several days after the attack. She required surgery on her hands and wrists, and the ring finger on her left hand was permanently disfigured, now sticking out at a 90-degree angle. She was asked not to return to her high school due to the publicity surrounding the case, and she finished her senior year at home, but did attend her high school graduation. She was awarded a $1.5 million settlement from the security form that had employed Rayleigh. Lori McKenna spent years dealing with post-traumatic stress that resulted in panic attacks. She entered therapy to process the trauma of the attack and the death of her friend. While living in San Francisco, Lori met her husband, a baseball player, who was just beginning his career as a pitcher for the San Francisco Giants. Later, they moved to her husband's home state of Georgia. She only returned to California to testify during Rayleigh's final round of appeals. Lori says that she believes Rayleigh deserves to die, but she has no interest in attending his execution, should it ever be carried out. She says she is happily married and life is good in Georgia where she currently lives. She runs a children's boutique in the small town where she and her husband purchased and remodeled a Victorian house. She doesn't often think about David Rayleigh or the attack, she says. February's are hardest as the memories return on the anniversary of the attack. She thinks of her friend Janine then and what should have been. Speaking with a reporter for the San Jose Mercury News, Lori remarked, she's not here. That's the most important thing that most people forget. She should have gotten married, had kids, done it all. There she stops, speaking mid-sentence, as she looks off wistfully, perhaps remembering that fateful day in 1985, when two friends were on an innocent adventure to visit a local landmark, the Carolans Mansion. The Carolans suffered damage during the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake and was once again in danger of being demolished. In 1991, the city of Hillsborough held the decorator showplace at the Carolans Mansion. This charity event drew over 68,000 curious locals who paid $20 per ticket to tour the inside of the mansion. Over the course of six weeks, 
more than $1 million was raised for the charity and brought renewed interest in restoring the mansion. In 1998, Dr. Ann Johnson and her husband, mutual fund billionaire Charles Bartlett Johnson, purchased Carolands for just under $6 million. Dr. Johnson and her interior decorator, Mario Buada, made it their goal to restore Carolands to its former glory, spending another $3 million to do so. In 2013, the Johnsons donated the Carolands to the newly formed Carolands Foundation, a private trust dedicated to preserving the cultural legacy, architectural heritage, and history of the Carolands Chateau. Tours of the house and gardens are complimentary, but are conducted only on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. and by reservation only. Visitors are selected by lottery. Charitable organizations may apply to hold events at the Carolands and gatherings for up to 175 guests for receptions, dinners, concerts, seminars, and lectures are allowed, but strictly for fundraisers or other nonprofit events. The chateau cannot be rented for corporate or personal events. In this way, the Carolands remains a very exclusive venue reserved for only a privileged few to enjoy. I think that Harriet Pullman Carolyn would approve. for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. I think I may have to enter that lottery to visit the Carolands. Who knows, maybe I'll bring one lucky listener along with me. To find out what I get up to all year long, make sure to follow me on social media. There are links to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok on our website, truecrimepodcast.com. You can also get all our episodes on YouTube, Spotify, and pretty much everywhere you listen to podcasts. Thanks for subscribing, following, and telling a friend. Once Upon a Crime is written and produced by me, Esther Ludlow. Lorena Garcia does research and production for the show and is also our social media manager. Copy editing was done by Crystal Jernan. Come back next week for another episode of the series Mansion Murders. And until next time, be good to one another. Mm-hmm.